Missouri Free Library, we have Tom Ratliff here for us. Tom is a former English and social studies teacher who writes historical fiction for young adults. He's an expert on Connecticut history and the Civil War. He has a master's degree in early American history, and he has taught at Central Connecticut State University in both history and secondary education departments uh, for over 20 years, and he's recently been at Naugatuck Community College as well. Welcome to Tom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Some of you know I'm sort of a maritime history buff, so when I was asked to do this, I got pretty excited about it. So I, I, uh, once upon a time, it was about a three-hour discussion, and now I'm hoping it's like 45 minutes to an hour. So, um, all right, here we go. Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Tomorrow is the 77th anniversary. I'd like to start with a quote from Mark Twain. Mark Twain said that warfare was invented to teach Americans geography. And I think this is a good example because I, th I think on December 8th a lot of people woke up and went to a map and tried to figure out where the heck Hawaii was, right? All right. Okay. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt's speech uh, the next day to Congress, uh, he says, uh, a date which shall live in infamy. He says, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Uh, he says, one, af one hour after the Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States delivered a formal reply to a recent American message stating that further negotiations were useless. So he was supposed to uh, arrive 90 minutes before he actually did. So that was one of the many kerfuffles of, uh, surrounding uh, the attack itself. All right. One of the things Roosevelt said is that the message that was delivered, there was no hint or threat of war. All right. So these are the Hawaiian Islands. There are, what, about seven of them? There's actually several other islands in, in this arc. They're all formed uh, by a volcanic uh, vent here. And as the Pacific plate has shifted, the islands have each formed one by one. Uh, this is uh, the Aqua, which is sort of important to the story towards the end. All right. Uh, the United States in 1940, um, we had 134 million people, 30 million Americans lived on farms. I think today the number is 2 percent, so I, th I think uh, this gives us some idea of, 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 it's a nice truck here, huh? of the, the population. Uh, only 34 percent of the farms had electricity. As far as I know, I think almost everyone in America has electricity. Hartford had 166,000 people. We were the 51st largest city in America. Today, we're down to about 123,000, and I think we're about 155 or 160 in terms of size. Uh, Pinocchio and Fantasia were released the same year. Pretty cool. And of course, and I think this is fitting, uh, the most popular song in 1940 was White Christmas. Bing Crosby. All right. Uh, this is uh, Pearl Harbor itself. Uh, does this show up if I do it? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Uh, the harbor is, is divided into three sections. They're called locks. This is the west lock, the middle lock, where a number of ships were. The east lock, this is where Battleship Rose. This is Ford Island here. So uh, it's a lagoon harbor on the island of Oahu. Uh, it's about 10 square miles of water overall. There are three locks or separations. Uh, it's Ford Island. Uh, in, in, in Hawaiian, it's called uh, Wai'i Momi. Uh, which means uh, pearl water, and of course that's because for uh, hundreds or thousands of years they were able to harvest pearl oysters. All right, so let's look at the timeline of the history here. Let me just get some check that out. Can, can you read that at all? Or is that kind no. of blurry? False. Oh, oh, oh. It looks blurry to me, but I don't have my glasses on. So. All right, uh, about 1820 we see American missionaries going into Hawaii. A number of the later very wealthy families are descended from these early missionaries. Uh, by about 1840, uh, whaling in the Atlantic is, is, is waning and, and the fleets are starting to come into the Pacific and, and Hawaii becomes one of the key bases for the American whaling uh, fleet in the Pacific. Um, by 1865, just at the end of the Civil War, the North Pacific Squadron was formed uh, for the U.S. Navy, and they operated in and out of here for a while. Uh, by 1870, the ships were getting so big, they actually had to, uh, to uh, uh, dredge the channel uh, to, to, uh, uh, 
to accommodate the larger ships. All right. Uh, in the 19th century, the American influence in the uh, uh, Pacific was expanding. Uh, we purchased Alaska here in 1867. I know when you think about it in your mind, you think, well, what does Alaska have to do with the Pacific Ocean? It's kind of key here, the way that it extends down. Um, in 1867, Midway Island here was the next. There was actually nobody living there. It's, it's probably about three times the size of this building. It's very, very tiny. Uh, <clears throat> in 1875, a reciprocity treaty was signed with Hawaii. It gave the U.S. Navy exclusive rights to Pearl Harbor for two things. Number one, for repairs. Number two, for coaling. Do we know what coaling is? It's, you, you, you go into a gas station today to fill your car up with gas. When you have a ship that op, a steamship that operates on coal, uh, uh, you need to have uh, coaling stations, as it will. And so, so Pearl Harbor was an important coaling station for the American fleet. In August of 1898, uh, Hawaii was annexed, and uh, that same year, both the Philippines and Guam uh, were uh, were uh, obtained uh, during from the Spanish-American War. So what we can see here is the United States suddenly has all of these coaling stations or stepping stones to get to, to this area. Uh, uh, and the reason they wanted to do that is then as now, uh, about 20% of all people on earth live in China. And so when American businesses were looking at where could they expand trade, uh, China was, uh, actually China's here, I'm sorry, that's Russia, uh, was an appealing uh, target. All right, in the meantime, the Japanese were expanding. Um, before 1868, the Japanese, uh, the, the, they were, uh, the government was, was run by the shoguns who were warlords. Uh, 1868, the Mijai Emperor was restored. He was the either grandfather or great-grandfather of Hirohito. I'm not sure which. Um, at this point, though, J Japan enters on a program of rapid, rapid industrialization. Um, 1894, 1895, uh, there's a war fought with China. It's called the Sino-Japanese War. At this point, Taiwan is ceded, the island of Formosa. Um, the Russo-Japanese War, 10 years later, uh, 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 Japan actually claimed certain uh, parts of, of Manchuria. Uh, this is Port Arthur here, which is sort of, if you look at Korea, it's one of, in one of the little elbows there. Uh, the Russo-Japanese War started in 1904 when Japan, uh, they sailed into Port Arthur Harbor and they attacked and sank the Russian fleet. So this was a surprise attack. This was actually three hours before they actually declared war on them. So this was sort of a, a so that's a precedent, I think. All right. Uh, in 1910, Japan annexed Korea. Here's our Korean peninsula here. In 1931, they annexed Manchuria. Some people date the beginning of World War II with, with the annexation of, of, of Manchuria. Uh, 18, 1937, uh, Japan uh, extend, expands from here uh, and occupies uh, about the eastern, what, third or so of China. Um, at this point, we begin to supply the Chinese, which doesn't make the Japanese very happy, right? So our relations with, with uh, Japan are going downhill. Japan then as now imports 90% of their raw materials. They don't have, they don't have uh, vast uh, s uh, supplies of anything. Um, so the attacks on China, we begin sending aid to the Chinese. Um, in 1940, Japan attacks Indochina, which is Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos right here. Uh, they're hoping to disrupt the flow of supplies coming in here. Um, <clears throat> And because of that, we placed an embargo on oil and scrap metal uh, that we were uh, shipping uh, to Japan. Uh, at this point, uh, the Japanese believed we were at war, whether it was declared or not. So, all right. Uh, at this time, Roosevelt moves the Pacific Fleet, which, is, which was stationed in San Diego, moves them out to Pearl Harbor as a precautionary measure. All right. Um, there were several blunders made along the way here. Uh, when we were in uh, hostile negotiations, all of the military bases were supposed to be on full alert. Um, this was true in some places. It wasn't so true in Pearl Harbor for a couple of reasons. So uh, 
The attack Sunday morning was, was, was based on, on the idea that most of the men would either be asleep or hung over or on leave or not paying attention. Uh, and, and General Short, who was in charge of the Army, and Admiral Kimmel, who was in charge of the Navy, they, serious, they did not believe that Japan either could attack or had the capacity to attack. So, uh, so Pearl Harbor, rather than be on high alert, there, there was no alert. Um, uh, uh, the other thing that happens is radar technology is fairly new and a lot of people don't really rely on it. So when the first report it comes in of, of airplanes coming in, they were discounted and there was also a fleet of American planes that were supposed to be coming in from the United States. Uh, and so somebody said, oh, it's just those planes that are early, which proved to be wrong, obviously. And this is, this is uh, Waikiki Beach in 1940. You know, it's sort of a uh, uh, island paradise, yes? All right. So was it a surprise attack or not? There, there was a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of stories in the newspaper about whether we were going to war with Japan. This is the Hilo uh, uh, Tribune Herald. This is from uh, a week before. I think this is November, uh, yeah, November 30th. Japan may strike over the weekend. So, so there was this, this idea that maybe war was imminent and maybe at least the people in Hawaii or some of them were, were afraid that war was coming, right? They were wrong by a week, right? All right. At this time, 52% of Americans believed that war with Japan was inevitable. Um, <clears throat> although many people felt that Germany was a bigger threat. Japan was farther away. There was not a whole lot known about Japan, whereas Germany had been at war in, in, in Europe for, what, about 18 months by now. Uh, and, and there was a, an understanding of, of German military power. Uh, <clears throat> And Admiral Kimmel had actually uh, received a war warning uh, early that morning saying, be on the alert, we think an attack is imminent, and he ignored it. He gets fired after all of this, which, um, all right. So uh, for Japan, this proves to be a diplomatic fiasco. This is actually a picture taken of, of Pearl Harbor. This is, this is Ford Island. This is taken from a Japanese plane. The Japanese had uh, uh, planes. Uh, they were filming and they were taking photographs. Um, so the Japanese uh, secret code had been broken by the military. Uh, and their code was supposed to be changed every so often. In the day, it was November 26th, the day the Japanese fleet left Japan, the code changed, but the ships didn't get the new code. So we had the old code. Uh, and, and so when the messages were coming in, uh, we, were, we were actually decoding them faster than the Japanese uh, were. Uh, so we intercepted uh, messages and we knew that Japan was about to, to break diplomatic ties. The problem is it was a 14-part message and the Japanese ambassador Ambassador actually had trouble decoding it, which is why he was 90 minutes late. The timing is supposed to be he walks in to see Cordell Hall, he says, here's my passport, I'm breaking diplomatic ties, and he leaves, and 30 minutes later the bombs drop 5,000 miles away in Hawaii. Uh, he shows up uh, about half an hour after we were getting reports that the bombs were actually falling. So, all right, so here's Cordell Hall. I can't imagine what's going through his mind when he knows that, 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 that Pearl Harbor has been attacked. Um, he knows the ambassador's there to deliver this message. He's already read and, and it's been decoded, and he can't let on any of that. He was actually uh, instructed uh, uh, not to even say that he knew about the attack. And he certainly wasn't going to say, you know, we decoded your messages and we, we know what's going on because that was a certainly top secret stuff. So. Uh, uh, I don't know if I could have stood there and, and just sort of said thank you very much and accepted the passport and not wanted to say something. <laughs> All right. Um, so December 7, 1941, this is a, a sneak attack. Uh, the Japanese fleet's about 240 miles off here. Um, they're hitting largely the, the naval base in the east lock here, although they hit some of the ships in the, in, in the middle lock. Uh, they're going to hit the air bases. There's a, you can't see it very well, can you? There's a small air base on Ford Island here. Um, Hickam Field is here. Uh, Wheeler Field is here. Uh, Kanoe is over here. Uh, Iwa is a, actually a marine base and field right here. So, so they want to hit the air bases and, and they're aiming uh, at, at, at the big ships. They want to get the biggest ships they can. Uh, the Japanese strategy, supposedly they were getting ready to attack the Dutch East Indies and they were afraid of American intervention. So they thought if they could knock out the American fleet, at least slow the Americans down, that, that, that they would be able to, uh, to uh, move forward unopposed. 
All right. Uh, this is uh, the main area. This is Ford Island here. This is Battleship Row here. Uh, the battleships were the key uh, targets. And about three quarters of the Americans that died that day uh, were on uh, uh, the battleships right in here. All right. There were a total of 102 vessels in, in Pearl Harbor. So this is a massive, massive, massive um, naval facility. Uh, there were the eight battleships here. Actually, there's only seven. The Pennsylvania is in here. They're in the dry dock. Uh, eight cruisers, which would have been the next size targets. They're a little bit smaller. Uh, about 30 destroyers. Uh, these were less interesting targets. Uh, there were 12 ships that had been reclassified uh, as destroyers. And there were a number of submarines, minesweepers, cargo ships, tugboats, and repair ships. And if you can see the Vestal right here sitting next to the Oklahoma, uh, that's a repair ship. So on this, it looks like they're the same size. That's not true at all. If, if the, if the uh, Arizona is this big, the Vestal's about this big, right? Now, what's going to happen is the ships that are outboard here are, or, 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 uh, are, are going to be more vulnerable to attack because they're being attacked by, uh, 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 they're dropping torpedoes, and, and it's hard to, you can't torpedo them when they're protected like that. So the bombs in, the, the ships inward were generally bombed, and the ships outward were bombed and torpedoed. All right. So the Japanese fleet, this is the first air fleet of the Japanese Navy. There are six aircraft carriers. They had 353 planes, torpedo bombers, dive bombers, level bombers, which would be the ones just coming in at ground level, and also fighters to protect the bombers. Uh, when the Japanese fleet left, the, the normal shipping lanes were down here. They purposely stayed north of the shipping lane so they wouldn't be detected. It took them, what, nine, four, it took them about 13 days to, to, to get to Hawaii. All right, so the Japanese assessment, this is actually a Japanese map that was drawn that day. Uh, they have phot photography and video planes to calculate the effectiveness. And this is a quote from the, uh, the air leader. Uh, w when he arrives and he realizes it's a complete uh, surprise, he says, the effectiveness of our attack was now certain and the message surprise attack successful was accordingly sent to the flagship. Uh, at 7.53, the message was received by the carrier and relayed to the homeland. Uh, now, they had a code word, right? They're not, they're not going to say, hey, look, here we are over Pearl Harbor and we're the Japanese fleet and we're bombing. So, uh, so the, the code word is Tora, 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 which I think means tiger. Um, so this is the code word that the surprise had worked. Uh, at 7.58, the first wave uh, 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 comes about. And within 20 minutes, uh, most of the damage is done to the battleships. Um, this looks like it might be the Utah sinking. Uh, so the hope was to hit the aircraft carriers. There were three aircraft carriers in the Pacific Fleet. They were all out to sea. Actually, two were out on maneuvers, and one was sailing back to the US for repairs. Um, so the battleships become the next key target. They're the biggest ships. They're all probably six or 700 feet long, and they all have around 1,400 men on them. Uh, so in the first wave, they're not overly successful. Only eight of 49 bombs hit and explode, and only 17 of 40 torpedoes. But that's enough to, just, to do serious damage uh, to, uh, to the battleships. Uh, the Japanese also had submarines. They, they had five two-man subs, uh, and the idea was they were hoping to sneak these into Pearl Harbor uh, uh, to attack uh, American ships uh, f from a different angle. Um, there are a couple subs that are unaccounted for even to this day, so we're not really sure if some got in or not. Um, and of course, some of the ships, when they sank, they were so, uh, they had been hit so many times, no one really knew what if they had also been hit by submarines or not. So, so these have two torpedoes each. Uh, one was sunk by the USS Ward early on. This was about 6 a.m. Bef before the, 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 the airplane attack started. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the Ward reported this, uh, uh, the base should have gone on high alert, and they didn't. Um, one entered the harbor uh, and, and was sunk by the USS Mon Mon Monaghan, which is another destroyer. One of the purposes of destroyers is to sink submarines, or at least find them. Uh, one washed up on shore before the attack. This is the one that washed up on shore. Uh, one of the men inside the submarine uh, was killed. The other was captured. He was the first prisoner of war of the war. All right. And again, two were never found. So, so there's a lot of the history we don't really know about uh, and we'll probably never know. 
All right, this is Battleship Row itself. There are seven battleships. They're all anchored off Fort Island. Usually about half were out to sea, so the idea that they were all in port was kind of unusual. Certainly, if, if an alert had been issued, they would have been out to sea. Um, the Pennsylvania is here in a dry dock. They tried to bomb the Pennsylvania, but it was protected by the sides of the dry dock. Um, there were actually, I think, about nine people killed on the Pennsylvania, but generally speaking, there was uh, minimal damage there. Uh, there was another ship. There were supposed to be nine battleships in the fleet, uh, and that's the Colorado, but the Colorado was in the Puget Sound Navy Yard being refitted. All right. This is where I have to geek you out a little bit on, on, on Navy stuff. <laughs> Most of these battleships were built around 1914 to 1919. They're all about 600 feet long or so, 90 feet at the beam, which is the widest point. Um, and the, the highest mast is about 106 feet high. Um, about 12 to 1400 officers and men, and this is the way they're designed. A is the belt armor here. This is between eight and 13 inches. If it's just regular uh, uh, compartment, it's eight inches. If they're storing uh, uh, powder or things that are explosive, it's up to 13 inches. So if you can imagine 13 inches of steel, you know. These things weigh upwards of like 55 or 60,000 tons. So they're, they're pretty massive. Um, oh, I'm, uh, yes. They also have, in areas they have sloping bulkheads. The idea is if, if the bulkhead is straight and the bomb hits it, that's bad. If it's on an angle, hopefully it glances off in some way. Uh, seems like real low tech for, uh, and then this is the torpedo belt here. And what this is, is you have, you have the side of the ship and then you have this empty space and you have the second area. In between here, you have these uh, 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 little bulkhead supports going this way. And the idea is if the ship is hit with the, if you don't have this and the ship is hit with a torpedo, it sinks. If you have this, the torpedo hopefully just blows up this and the ship is still intact, right? And the other thing we need to know about ships, uh, is that the internal spaces, spaces are all sectioned off with watertight doors. So even if, if you blow a hole in here, you can close that off. And, and in the case of a battleship, there are about a thousand compartments. So, so you could easily have, take several hits and ideally uh, remain afloat. All right. This is the US Arizona BB-39. Uh, the BB is the battleship designation. All of the battleships used to be named for states. All right, so the, the, the Arizona was one of the first hit. It was attacked by 10 dive bombers. Uh, seven armor-piercing shells hit the ship. Uh, four of them didn't do any serious amount of damage, uh, or three didn't, but four, there were four direct hits, and the last direct hit was on the uh, forward uh, magazine. Uh, so if you imagine, here's the stack. If this is the forward part of the ship, here's a bomb that comes down. It goes through the two-inch steel deck. The second deck below that is six inches of steel. It goes through that. It ends up in the powder magazine and it blows up. And there were probably several thousand pounds of gunpowder TNT. So it's it just, if, if you've seen videos of it, the ship actually sort of goes up like this. It almost looks like it breaks in half. It was, it was pretty awful. Um, it sank in nine minutes. This is 600 feet long. I mean, I, I, when I go to Central, I look at the, at the, at the buildings that there are, so, you know, and I say, the Arizona was bigger than this. I can't imagine anything that big in, in 12 minutes or seven minutes, anything happening. How big was the Arizona? About 608 or 10 feet long. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I was on a destroyer, and the destroyer, it was sort of like being in a sardine can. Everything was tiny. I've, I've been to the USS Massachusetts, and I, it's like this. It's like the ceilings are high. The, it's like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't strike me that it's a, it's a Navy ship because it, you should be like walking around like this all the time. So, yeah, um, about half of the people that died uh, died on the Arizona. As a matter of fact, about three quarters of those that died died on the battleships. All right. The second is the Oklahoma, BB-37. The Oklahoma was hit by five torpedoes. It capsized in 12 minutes. That means it went it over. Uh, 429 casualties. A lot of the men uh, were able to escape to the Maryland, which was next to it, and, and continue fighting. Um, 
This was, it was salvaged in 1942. It was so seriously damaged that they weren't ever going to put it back into, into service, but they had to get it out of, out of the mud. Uh, so it's salvaged and repaired. It was decommissioned in 1944, and it was sold for scrap in 1947. So, uh, so that's the Oklahoma. This is the USS Nevada. BB-36. It was not moored alongside another ship. That was kind of a disadvantage because it gets hit by a torpedo very early on, but the damage was, was minimal, and so they were able to get underway. And, and uh, actually what happened is the captain was on shore leave. The executive officer, when the torpedo hit, he was either knocked into the water or thought the ship was sinking and jumped into the water. So there was, I think, a lieutenant, some, some very low officer decided to get underway. So here they are, they're sailing towards the mouth, towards the narrow channel. It's probably the dumbest thing in the world because if they were sunk in the channel, it would have taken six months to a year to clear the channel. And that would have been, that would have achieved more damage to the U.S. naval uh, capacity than anything else. Um, what happens, though, is they're heading for the channel. They're hit by five dive bombers, and, and the whole ship catches fire. So what they do is if here's Ford Island and they're going this way, they sail back around Ford Island, and, and, and they actually run the ship in, into the mud. Uh, so it's, uh, it's beached at Hospital Point on the west side of Ford Island. Still. What's that? Till this day. No, no, they, they, they got it out. Being beached, it was easy to get rid of. Yeah, the only ships that are there, the Arizona is still there and the Utah is still there. Yeah. Uh, and it was actually repaired and it saw service through the war. Uh, the Utah was hit by two torpedoes. It capsized within nine minutes. Uh, <clears throat> there were about 64 killed. Um, <clears throat> They've, they, this is one of the efforts they're trying to, 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 to salvage it. They, they tried to get it upright and they couldn't. So it is sitting there uh, to this day. It's, it's a, I know we all think of the Arizona. We've seen the Arizona Memorial. There's a second smaller memorial uh, to the Utah. Um, in 1988, it was, well, it was declared a national mon historic landmark, as was the Arizona. All right. So West Virginia was hit by seven torpedoes and two bombs. Uh, the crew worked for about six hours. They were fighting the fires and they were able to keep the ship afloat, but, but about two o'clock it was decided that, that it, it, it was uh, uh, not going to be saved. Uh, so they abandoned uh, and it sank about two o'clock. Uh, I think there were about 60 or 65 casualties on this ship. It was repaired and refloated in 1942, uh, rebuilt in 1944, and it was one of the few ships present at Tokyo Bay in September of 1945 uh, for the surrender, which I think was probably a, a very nice touch for those men. All right, California. Um, hit by two torpedoes and two bombs. It actually sank into the mud. It took three days. Uh, so it, it was, I think there were only maybe nine casualties on the, on, on the California. No, I'm sorry, 100 were killed. Um, it was refloated uh, and it also saw service during the war. Um, <clears throat> you have to imagine refloating these things is, is a huge, huge, huge project, right? It was decommissioned in 1946. One of the things we figured out in World War II is the battleships are kind of a waste of time. They're very big, they're very slow, uh, uh, they're very expensive to operate. During the war, what was, uh, aircraft carriers number one, submarines number two were, were significant, and the battleships, they, they looked good, but they didn't, they didn't have a real uh, 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 significant role to play. All right. So on December 7, 19, this is the Arizona Memorial here. Have we been there? I, 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 was, I was in Pearl Harbor twice. I, I was, I've seen that. Uh, um, as a matter of fact, when I was there, the first time they were filming the movie Tora, Tora, Tora. Do you know that movie? Yeah. So I'm one of the few people alive who has actually seen Japanese Zeros flying over, which was, was kind of bizarre. <laughs> yeah. And of course, they were not real Japanese. They were replicas, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so 18 ships were either sunk or run aground, 2,403 dead, and about 1,800 of them were on the, uh, uh, the battleships. Uh, 1,174 wounded, uh, 
35 civilians, 347 planes were damaged. Only a handful of planes got, out, got off the ground. Most of them were damaged. Uh, it was at Wheeler Field. Uh, all the planes were bunched together because the commanding officer thought that was safer, which was, you know, it wasn't because it didn't take too many bombs to blow them all up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> This is a link, I won't bother clicking on it, but this is the National Geographic. If you want to find something really cool and learn a lot about Pearl Harbor, uh, the National Geographic Society, they have, uh, it's, a, it's interactive. There's a timeline. It tells you from starting about five o'clock in the morning, the events that are happening. Each time you click on a time frame or an event, there are interviews with people that survived. Uh, um, there, there's, a, it's, there's a whole wealth of information there. It's, it's, uh, it's, if you didn't have me, you could easily just play with that for an hour or two. All right. All right, so the Japanese losses here. Uh, the Japanese actually lost 55 airmen. Uh, nine submariners, you know, they had the ten, uh, ten in, in the small uh, uh, submarines, uh, one survived but he was captured. Uh, they lost 29 airplanes uh, and 75 airplanes were damaged by anti-aircraft fire. Now the damaged planes were supposed to, the island of Niihua was supposed to be the, the rescue point. Um, the Japanese thought it was uninhabited, which wasn't true. But the, the, the idea was if your plane was damaged, if you could get to that island at some point, one of the carriers would come by and pick up anybody that they needed to pick up. Only one man actually did that, and he was killed by the natives eventually. All right, yeah, Niahua was the uh, designated recovery area for pilots. All right. The thing that is, is most interesting is that as much as the battleships were destroyed, um, there were a lot of key targets that could have been taken out that weren't. Uh, the headquarters uh, office building, which included all of naval intelligence for the Pacific, was in one place. So it wouldn't have taken too many bombs to wipe that out. There was a submarine base there. They absolutely missed it, and the submarines during World War II in the Pacific were essential to, to American uh, uh, support. Uh, the whole repair facilities. What's the point of blowing up ships when the repair facilities are there? And they started that afternoon repairing ships and trying to get them back together. There were fuel tanks. Millions and millions of gallons of fuel tanks. It wouldn't have taken too many bombs to just completely wipe that out. If the fuel tanks were hit, were taken out, it would probably take three to six months for the U.S. to just, just bring that stuff back. Uh, the aircraft carriers were at sea, and as I said before, the battleships really played very little role in the war. So were they high interest targets like, oh look, we sank this giant ship? Sure. Uh, from a military standpoint, it, it, it didn't, uh, wasn't very sensible. And the other thing, it's real easy to attack the ship sitting in the harbor, but the harbor is very shallow. You sink one of these ships at sea, and you know the the, uh, uh, the Titanic is what three miles of water. They're never going to bring that up. It's it's impossible. Uh, they could they brought up almost every ship because they weren't sitting in more than say say thirty or forty feet of water. Um, all right. Uh, there are additional attacks uh, that same day. Uh, they attacked Singapore which is right here in the tip of the Malay Peninsula. Uh, they attack uh, Guam, which is here. Uh, the, the initial attack on the Philippines. I lost the, oh, here's the Philippines right here. Uh, uh, Wake Island was attacked here. Uh, as, as was Midway. So, the, so uh, the Japanese goal was not just to take out Hawaii, but to obtain uh, is, is, is much of, of the other islands as possible. Uh, the, the, if the Japanese were to attack the United States, it was going to be because they occupied all of this territory and they could easily move uh, towards the United States. And of course, the uh, American military philosophy during the war was called island hopping because uh, we needed to get planes close enough to Japan that we could bomb, so we were taking islands in the Marianas uh, and, and retaking as many islands as possible, and every time we took an island, we'd build uh, 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 an airbase, and we were that much closer to bombing Japan. It wasn't until we took Iwo Jima that we could start bombing Japan, and we took actually Tinian, which is about here, which is where the, the Enola Gay took off from. All right, and they also took Hong Kong, which is right here, which was a British crown colony. All right, salvage efforts. This is the effort to, to, to bring up the Utah. Uh, you can see, I think there were 20 or 
25 or 30 uh, cranes set up. They put, um, they put several million tons of sand, coral sand in here. So as they, as they were writing it, it would actually catch the sand and, and sort of pop up. Uh, uh, they couldn't get the Utah up. They did get the Oklahoma up. You can see the Oklahoma is, is, is much uh, farther along. Um, so the Utah, uh, the, eventually they, they just leave it there. All right, uh, as, it, it, as, as a, uh, an attempt to strike back, the Doolittle Raid is in uh, April of, of 1942. This is what, four months after. Um, <clears throat> Today, you can get on an airplane in San Francisco airport, you can fly all the way to Tokyo. Plane has the capacity, has the fuel. Uh, back then, um, the American planes that were in uh, 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 Hawaii, when they flew from uh, the United States, they actually stripped them down. <laughs> they took off the armaments and everything because they would just sort of barely make the 2,000 mile flight with the fuel that they could carry. So, uh, so in order to bomb uh, Japan in 1942, uh, they had to put, uh, these are what, B-26 bombers on an aircraft carrier. They didn't even know if the planes could take off from an aircraft carrier. That's, uh, so they, uh, they practiced on that. Anyway, the Doolittle Raid, they, they got within what, about seven, 800 miles of Japan. They launched the planes. Uh, the planes are gonna bomb Japan and then they don't have enough fuel to come back and nobody's quite sure they could land on an aircraft carrier anyway. So they're going to land in Northern China. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, they're B-25 bombers. They're 16 medium bombers. Originally, they wanted to do 24, and they cut it down to 20, and then they finally decided they'd be lucky if they could get 16. Uh, this is on the USS Hornet. About 650 miles from Japan, they, they, they take off. Uh, they made a move, when I was a kid, I saw the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. That was, uh, that's, yeah. Um, and it was about the Doolittle Raid, about, you know, the, the, the raid was symbolic, right? They were dropping bombs on, on, on the capital city uh, of Japan, uh, but it wasn't highly effective. Uh, I think there were only about 55 civilians killed, uh, and I, I'm not even sure how accurate the bombings were. Anyway, uh, the pilots are going to land in China. About 77 of 80 pilots survive. I think eight or 10 of them get captured by the Japanese, and I think all but one survived the war. So it was, uh, it was, uh, Highly symbolic, it was the sort of thing that made people feel good, but if from a military standpoint, it really, it was extremely expensive. All right, as a result of, 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 of all of this, um, there's great concern uh, in, in the west coast of the United States, there's about 150,000 Japanese Americans living. <coughs> and, um, it was discovered that there were a number of Japanese spies in Hawaii who were spying on, on uh, uh, American bases. Uh, there was a, a Japanese dentist, for example, his, his, his office uh, overlooked Pearl Harbor and he was on a regular basis uh, looking at the ships that were coming in and out. Uh, so um, there was a great distrust of Japanese, uh, as you can imagine. So, so th it was decided that, especially if, if the, J the Japanese might eventually attack the American West Coast, uh, that something had to be done about, about the Japanese American. So uh, on February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signs Presidential Order 9066, and, and the order is to evacuate, uh, wasn't all, but it was most, uh, it was between 110 and 120,000 uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, from uh, the West Coast. Um, now some of these were Issei, they, were, they had been born in Japan, but the majority of them were what they call Nisei, who were second generation. They'd born in the United States. They were American citizens. Um, many of those young people, they had never been to Japan. They didn't speak Japanese. They didn't consider themselves Japanese. Um, <clears throat> But because of, of the concern, uh, uh, they were moved from the West Coast uh, for security reasons. There were 10 camps set up. These were not quite as bad as concentration camps, but pretty close. Uh, and, and the camps were in existence for about two and a half years. In 1944, a Japanese American uh, named Fred Korematsu, he actually sued. His case went to the Supreme Court. He lost, but the Supreme Court ruled that the camps were illegal. So, uh, so the camps were closed. It's about 20 years ago, I think, now that, that Congress voted, I think, 
twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars for each person that had been interred. Um, one of the options uh, that, that uh, was available to Japanese Americans, they could choose to be repatriated, which a lot of young men did. Uh, they went back uh, to Japan, um, which is near as I, what I've read about. That wasn't a very good choice because they weren't very welcome in Japan. They were considered Americans. Um, the other option that was uh, available, well, one of the options that was available if you were living in a camp is, is because there, there was a shortage of farm labor. Uh, there were a lot, of, a lot of people living in the camps. They traveled around and they worked on harvests, much like uh, migrant workers. Uh, and then uh, 14,000 uh, uh, Japanese uh, chose to join the American uh, army. Uh, in what was called, it was the 442nd Infantry. These were Nisei, these were all second generation. Um, the 442nd was, they did not fight in the Pacific, they fought in Europe. They were one of the most highly uh, decorated uh, units in the war. Um, there's any number of really uh, great stories of their heroism. Um, all right, there's a great deal of propaganda surrounding all of this. Um, See, today, if you, want to, if you want stuff like this, you just have to look on Facebook, right? And you find out someone's, what they like or don't like. Back then it was posters, right? Because there's no television and, and a radio ad you can hear. It's not that effective as, remember Pearl Harbor and List Now, right? They want to get you to join. Why do you want to join? Right? Uh, Avenge Pearl Harbor, join the Navy now, right? So these are, these are both, both uh, 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 messages uh, that are taking the anger that people felt uh, about Pearl Harbor uh, and, and applying it. Uh, two more uh, by Bonds, right? This little girl, little doll, this is great propaganda, right? I want my daddy back, right? And so here's her dad, he's fighting in the jungle somewhere. Uh, by Bonds, remember Pearl Harbor, right? And then this one is, is especially, you got the dagger, you got the blood, make him pay for that day. Uh, <clears throat> back up our battle skies, right? So these are all, these are all uh, propaganda posters. They had been, they were very effective in World War I, they were very effective in World War II. They used them for everything. They were telling you to plant a victory garden, they were telling you to buy war bonds, uh, they were telling you to conserve, uh, you know, uh, scrap metal and things like that. All right. Here's more. I didn't. Avenge Pearl Harbor. Our bullets will do it, right? So, so here's, here's Uncle Sam in, in the harbor, right? Here's the smoke of the ships. Here's the Japanese planes, right? Uh, uh, and then this is uh, my favorite. The flag's at half-mast. It's shot through, right? Uh, we hear, we highly resolve uh, that these dead shall not uh, have died in vain. Do we know what that's from? Gettysburg. Gettysburg Address, exactly, sure. So this is very clever, taking the, the, that quote of Lincoln from the Civil War uh, from after the Battle of, uh, of Gettysburg, uh, and it says, uh, uh, remember December 7th. So this is, this is a way, uh, probably more powerful than Facebook, if you can imagine that. All right. Uh, this is uh, Isoruku uh, Yamamoto. He was the Japanese admiral. Um, He had studied at Harvard from 1919 to 1921. He spoke English. He knew a lot about the United States. Uh, he had also been the naval attache for the Japanese government in Washington for about three or four years. So he had a fairly good understanding of the United States and, and U.S. culture. Um, <clears throat> He was opposed to the attack on Pearl Harbor because he didn't think it was going to be very effective. Uh, and, and after the attack on Pearl Harbor, when a lot of the military said, the Americans aren't really going to want to fight, they're going to sue for peace. And he said, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. He said, they're not going to give up. And if we're going to defeat them, we're, the only way we're going to do it is attack, attach, should be attack, the, the mainland and march our troops into Washington, D.C. And that's the only way that the Americans are going to give up. Uh, and uh, after Pearl Harbor, he said, I fear all we have done is awaken a sleeping giant and, and fill him with terrible resolve, which I think proved to be very accurate. He was actually killed in 1942 or 43. What's that? 44. 44. Sure. Uh, and, and because we had broken the Japanese code, we actually knew he was flying uh, uh, somewhere and, and his plane was actually shot down. So, um, yeah. 
All right, here's Pearl Harbor today. This is the Utah. So you can actually come out here uh, and, and view it from there. But you can see from the air, this is this 600 odd uh, foot ship. Um, and it's just, it's, it's uh, because it's, it's, uh, uh, it's considered a burial site because of, of the dead. Uh, this is the, uh, the Arizona. I know we think of the Arizona as this cool thing, but this is the actual ship here. See, this is the forward gun turret here. Uh, um, <clears throat> and that's really, um, it's quite an amazing, amazing thing to see. All right. Uh, and then I want to leave you with the pitch for Battleship Cove. This is the USS Massachusetts. It's in uh, Fall River. Uh, if you cross the river, if you cross the bridge uh, uh, into Fall River, as you go by, if you look over uh, 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 to the north, you can see the, the, the highest mass sticking up there a little bit. If you don't know what it is, you're like, eh. Every time I drive over, I point, I get my kids, I say, look at that, look at that, look at that. And they think I'm a history geek, so. <clears throat> Um, it's the USS Massachusetts BB-59. Uh, um, <clears throat> the other ship that's there is the Joseph P. Kennedy, uh, named for Joe Kennedy Jr. Uh, it's a destroyer. I like that one because I was on a destroyer, and I can walk around and point to my kids like, look at how small things are, and they, again, they just think I'm crazy. Uh, also, the USS Lionfish, which is a submarine. Um, <clears throat> There's also other things. There's PT boats and, and, and airplanes and all sorts of really, really cool stuff you can see. Uh, they have education programs. Um, and they also, this is my favorite part. I don't know if I do it because I've already slept on a Navy ship for a number of times. <laughs> they have nautical nights. Uh, I think it's mostly for Boy Scout troops and things like that, but, but kids can actually go in. They can sleep in actual real Navy bunks, which I don't know what the attraction is there. But uh, So anyway, I, I would recommend it. It's, what, about two and a half hours away. It's, it's very, very cool. Uh, uh, and and uh, if you... The first time I was on the Massachusetts, I was, it's, it's, again, it's, 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 like, it's like being on a football field. And uh, I was trying to imagine how many bombs it would take for this thing to sink, you know, because it's just, it's just, it's like this building only 10 times bigger. At any rate, that's the end of my talk. Um, do we have any questions or? You, you mentioned that um, Guam, Hong Kong, Singapore, the, those were bombed at the same time? Yes. At the same time, it, was it like... It was in the afternoon. It was in the afternoon. So, yeah, so... Did they gain access to... I mean, did the Philippines fall at that time? It, it fell... I feel like I should know this one. Four or five months later, I believe it was. What is it? Later, but... A few, a few months later, the Philippines fell, yes. Okay. And yeah, the, Guam the, and Hong Kong, Singapore also fell after those attacks? I think they were taken that same day or within the next few days. The Philippines wasn't... wasn't it, it, the the whole uh, uh, Corregidor, Batan, all of that stuff. I think that was a few months afterwards. Yeah. What was what was the name of the ship that sunk a submarine two hours before the main attack? Oh, that was the. Um, if I wanted to research that. Uh, let's see. And how far away from? Pearl Harbor or Oahu was that? It was, I think, only about 10 or 15 miles outside the, the mouth of the harbor. The communications were such that they, they couldn't announce that? Or? Uh, I don't know. Um, the, 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 uh, it, the, the, the ship sent a message saying, we, we, we've, we think we saw a submarine, and then they launched some, uh, some depth charges and they sank it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the high command didn't really respond to that, you know, because I, I think they didn't believe that there could have been a Japanese submarine there. It's the same thing when, 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 the, when the, the radar station announced, they said, we have a lot of planes coming in and they seem to have the Japanese markings. Uh, the, the first message was, well, they're probably just American planes. And, and when another message came in, uh, the, supposedly the commander said, the, the, you must be wrong. It couldn't be happening. I, I want proof. And then about five minutes later, supposedly his office was being bombed and someone said, look out the window. There's all the proof you need. So I, I think a lot of people, they didn't want to believe it. Well, it seemed like the... The USS Ward, the Ward, W-A-R-D, that's the, that's the one, yes. Interesting. USS Ward, 
But it seems like Pico and Hilo is a relatively long way away from assuming the Hilo was published in Hilo. Right. If they knew a week before, they said, well, it could be next Tuesday or so, whatever, you know, a week away, they're going to bomb. And so the anticipation was such among common people. Yes, yes. That you wonder where these, you know, the general staff or whatever you call them of the, the hierarchy of the Navy and the Army were that uh, they wouldn't have taken more precautions. You would, it's almost hard to imagine. You would think that they would, but I think that's part of what makes the narrative so frustrating and so interesting. The, the, the idea that, that you have, especially where, where uh, Admiral Kimmel gets a message a couple hours before the attack saying, you should be on high alert. We, we have information that, that something bad might be coming. Uh, and he just absolutely ignored it. So. Were the American ships using Chinese coal? Coal? Yeah. I'm not sure they were in, in Pearl Harbor. I think they probably were in the rest of the Pacific, sure. I, I think that would be one of the... They were transporting coal from San Francisco or someplace to... Yeah, yeah, they, would, they were basically bringing, bringing the coal from the United States mostly, at least on that part. I, I'm pretty sure in the Philippines they were acquiring it more locally because it would have been... Uh, it would have taken more coal to get the coal, you know... <laughs> Uh, by then, though, some of the ships were, had, a lot of the ships had, the bigger ships had converted to oil. I think they did somewhere after World War I, so. Yes, sir. Oh, just, just making that point that I think at that point they, they switched to diesel engines. They did switch to diesel engines, sure. Largely up until World War I. Yes, yeah. Yes, sir. Did they have carrier groups at that time? And if, if so, why were the carriers out and there was no group? Because usually now, this time you have yeah, the carrier would have six or eight destroyers with it and a cruiser and all that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think they did when they were officially doing something, but when they're in, Har in when they're in at Pearl Harbor, the individual ships or a few ships would go out on on, on uh, exercises. You know, I, I know that two or three battleships would go out. They'd probably go out with two or three destroyers and they just sort of practice things. You know. Yes, sir. I've been wondering about the, the, the war sinking the. The submarine. They weren't at war yet. No. And how did he know that, you know, it seemed to me, if you, oh, I see a submarine, I think I was going to sink it. Wouldn't that start a war? You might think so, yeah. I I, I really don't know what, what, I don't know if they were certain that it was Japanese or they just assumed that because there was a ship that they didn't know what it was, it was so, so close to the mouth. You don't know what the consequences are going to be. It seemed to me that the captain would be in. Well, that was my that was my thinking, sir. That exactly. The, how do you know that it wasn't an American submarine? Exactly. If if it was, it would have been a very different outcome. Yeah, wow. sure. Jeez. Yeah, I, I I have no idea. I I don't know who who makes that decision. At what point do you do you do you get the information and you say, oh, maybe this is. Uh, an enemy sub. I, I think because it was so small, we didn't have small submarines. And, and I think when they recognized that it was only about 60 or 70 feet long, that, that it, was, uh, it was believed that it had to be an enemy sub. So. And the rumors had been flying. What's that? And there had been rumors. Yeah, that's the other thing. There were a lot of rumors flying around. So I, I think when the captain sees the submarine, it, it's a pretty safe bet for him to say, uh, I, I bet this is Japanese and I bet it's trouble. So, yeah. I don't know what protocols they went through, if they tried to send a message or to, to find out what the ship was. You know, if it was a surface ship and they, they'd see a flag, or if they weren't sure, they would try to send a message and say, you know, an unidentified ship, identify yourself, who are you? We're an American warship. So I don't know what happens with submarines like that. So. I mean, was there sonar in 1940? No. Yeah. Sonar was developed. Well, it was developed here in New London, I want to say after the war. The Naval Underwater Sound Labs were, yeah. 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 That seems remarkable to me. That they, it deserves more attention, I would say. I, I think it does. I think it does. And, and so um, the good news about all of this is, is that there are tons and tons and tons of websites out there, some really good ones. The History Channel has an amazing website that's interactive. The National Geographic, uh, I, it, it's, it's, it's one of the websites I don't mind wasting an hour or two on the Internet because it's, it's so educational and so interesting. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for me. 
Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.